Hello, everyone. Welcome to the University of the Underground. We are a free, pluralistic, and transnational university based uh, all over the world today, but we were founded in 2017 in the basement of a nightclub in Amsterdam. My name is Naum, and I am the head of program of I Want to Believe, an investigation into religion and belief systems and how they interact with politics, economic society, and nation states. Uh, I would like to welcome today to our researchers and also to any visiting participants or anyone watching this video, we, we ask you please to support the university by donating uh, through our website. Uh, today, we have a 40 minute talk followed by 15 minute Q&A with um, some very special guests. So I'm going to uh, introduce all of them. We have today Diana McCarthy, uh, who's a professor at the Mertz Academy, Stuttgart, and founding editor of Reboot.fm in Berlin. We have Dr. Michke van der Drift, uh, who's a visiting lecturer at the Royal College of Art in London and tutor at the Royal Academy of Art uh, in The Hague. We also have uh, one of your tutors, uh, Dr. David Munoz Alcantara, who has a PhD from Aalto University, ESPO, and is the founder of the research studio, NAES, Nomad Agency Archive of Emergent Studies. And finally, uh, also joining us today, uh, we have uh, Alexei Radinsky, uh, who is an independent filmmaker and writer and participant of the Visual Culture Research Center in Kiev. Um, so today we have this uh, power team of humans that are going to lecture about magic communism. So the stage is yours. Welcome. Okay, thank you. So Mike, taking that that I should start then. So yeah, so welcome, we are the Red Forest. I would usually not introduce myself as any sort of professor. And I'm one of a group of people that started the free artist radio Reboot FM. If it would be up to me, I would just go with angry feminist with a great sense of humor. So forget all the other official things. I'm going to give a really short introduction to how like magic communism sort of got, um, let's say, started coming to be a thing and started to be getting seriously developed within our group of what do we now call Red Forest or Red Forest Assembly or Red Forest Alliance. And that is like, one thing is that there's always a, or an apparent contradiction between what it means to be a committed Marxist, committed Leninist, committed anarchist, committed communist, it doesn't allow a lot of space for other ways of thinking that allow for not understanding everything. Superstition, magic, tarot cards, and sometimes just enjoying a really good time and being like conscious of what it means to share and to share in a joyful moment and understanding that that brings about a certain kind of energy that is good for the world and good for yourself. So, for me, like magic communists started to be a way of distinguishing between those of us that are weirdo communists that still are very deeply committed to making this world better now, also taking into account who's going to be in the world in the future, and definitely like very aware of how many shoulders it has taken to get us where we are now, the ancestors, the kin, all the energies in the like world that we don't particularly understand, but help us sometimes carry through our movements. <clears throat> so you know, in that case, like if I have a really, let's say hardcore mar materialist Marxist friend, we might be talking, researching bank robbers in turn of the century Georgia, and we'll get goosebumps at the same time. For me, that's a sign that something, that we're onto something. I can say even those friends that don't have a wit of superstition, have also had to accept that there are moments when they also get the goosebumps and we don't know why, but we know what it means. So I can say I'm coming from New Mexico. 
So I was a little bit, which is in the southwest of the US, has a very large uh, native population. So Navajo, uh, Comanche, Hopi, Apache. So many, many different nations are still living there. And a lot of belief systems are still very much present and also informed by like relationships with nature, relationships with something that could be called magic. There's the space that's born up between Spanish colonial families like mine that mixed and that found new ways to be religious that are outside of the church. And that also allow for a dialogue with the ancestors. And so that's something I grew up with these contradictions and still have to live with them and being as like trying to bring about political forces and trying to get partially like, let's say, liberated from my old superstitions and then going through a process where I find them useful and valuable and something to take seriously. I can say this, I don't know how many of you live in Germany, but I would also say it's a way to combat a certain type of German culture, maybe Western culture that associates politics with misery and that, that we don't need to be miserable, you know, and like I dance with communists in the park behind Mauerpark every Saturday since September as a way to do something. And we are really creating an energy that is good for us, but good for everybody who joins in. But we do it consciously as communists, sharing what little we have in order to have more. So that's something I, I see that it also seems to me that we need a space for weird thinking that does always make sense and that relies on yeah, whatever it is, people want to read their horoscopes, but that takes up, that allows for a space that isn't inhabited by eco fascists. Because I think that's, an, that's a really strong political force, which is where a lot of people with esoteric leanings find a place to be political that is really at odds with what, let's say, better energies should be about bringing about in this world. I think with this, I would I would pass the I would pass on myself over and transmit over to David, who I think will take up the next track. Okay. Hey, uh, how is the sound? Uh, right. Cool. So uh, maybe I will try to open a general distinction. Uh, in terms of uh, what could be magical in Marxism. <laughs> uh, very, it seems like a very uh, boring thing, but, uh, but it's not. I mean, the sense that uh, it does not only analyze what exists in reality, but it also, it's a way to imagining what it's unforeseen, trying to anticipate, uh, but also initiate the potential transformation of reality and the mutation of its forms. So we can say that there is a magical dimension in the historical materialist unfolding that it's kind of uh, becomes an act of knowing thoroughly. So it's an act uh, of uh, pushing knowledge beyond what it's considered possible in knowledge. So, uh, so sorry, impossible in knowledge. So it's a, it's a process of approximating to impossibility. To, is a process of making the impossible tangible. It is at the same time a sensible transformation because it is uh, it, it gets activated to poetical disruptions that contest kind of uh, metaphysical definitions uh, like something exists because uh, God's will or whatsoever, uh, putting kind of uh, uh, or trespassing the normativity that this produces through through activating noise, noises glitches to those uh, uh, conditions that are perceived as sedimented or ontological forms. Uh, then for transforming them or materializing as a let's say a revolutionary power. And in this sense, uh, also the suggestion is to think that uh, the magic sense of uh, communism is not obfuscation, but the contrary. So to play with uh, uh, forms of encryption, stenographic tools, to transfer mobilization, to transfer the reproduction of imaginative potentials and so on. So this, this already defines a function, which is a function of reciprocity and dependency. 
uh, between different, like multidimensional uh, relationality. Because in order for the message to be received, you need the, so the, the other one to play in tune with the magic you're, you're spelling, let's say. Um, the access of condition is also collectively mediated. It is networked in the flows. It, in this process, it builds a magical collective body, the socialist witchcraft, the indigenous wood science. Uh, it, it's materialization response to process of reverberation, feedbacking of sense shifting, contextual embodied practices, incantation, dangers, reproducing ways of being with the world that escape capitalist logics, uh, turning sorcery into a rigorous channeling of revolutionary intention. So that other reality that it's becoming possible. Uh, to cast a revolutionary spell, it is a sonic struggle in the sense that it touches and transgress. It transforms, but it becomes transformed at the same time. So it needs a, 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 sense, a sensual materiality to, to which resonate with it. It is a sonic struggle with the implications of its echoes and the cultural practices, those far enough away to make their own local meanings out of the echo before it decay and it's swallowed by infinity. It is uh, in this the re recovering of the revolutionary spell as a clandestine meeting of collective futures in present needs. The other way, the other tongue, the other history, the dreams of rebelliousness surviving through encoded knowledge, the power that turns into met the terms, uh, metaphors and needs back to concrete signs of different ways of living. The revolutionary embracement of impossibilities showing needs as the limits of the imagination in society and therefore politicizing them back to the libertary will, the active recovery of sense and enchantment of life, the spiritual and ethical dimension of socialism, the faith in revolutionary struggle, the commitment to emancipatory causes, the willingness to risk life itself. Uh, this is a dance with uncertainty of circumstances that contest a symmetry of orders in order to turn spontaneity, what appears as, as non, uh, not imaginable, into a collective channeling of willpower. Uh, so activating the unimaginable, unimaginable. Magic as revolutionary methodology of non-definite knowledge, magic as a bridge, bridge and the loss of form, the opening of collective learning, healing, the articulation of a we, they, shamanistic, uh, uh, unseparated practice, the magical body as an echo chamber, and maybe quote, closing with a quote from um, uh, perceiving something simultaneously on mediated from two different angles, creating a split awareness that can lead to the ability to control perception, to balance contemporary society's worldview with the non-ordinary worldview, to move between them to a space that simultaneously exists and does not exist, a call entering the real Nepantla, uh, the Nahuatl world for an in-between space, uh, El Lugar en Medio. This is from uh, Ansaldúa. Uh, the light in the dark, the pants. So uh, maybe, Mike, you you can help even grounding this a bit more. Yeah, thanks. Into the complexities. And Diana, it was really a nice nest to land in, uh, having set, been set up so well. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the intuition. The intuition is a form of how we uh, sense and make connections in environments. Um, and I think it is quite good to sit with that for a bit, because I first want to talk about how... Um, is that me? Oh. You're yeah, all that, sound, right? Yes, we can hear it. I don't know where it's going from. <laughs> I guess I got just given a beat. 
Um, <laughs> there and we go. something on your uh, on your uh, keyboard, pressing. Yeah. You're right. Thank you so much. Uh, too many things on my desk. You don't want to know what's under this picture. Um, thanks. <laughs> um, there we go. So intuition is a connection to the environment. I think that was my statement. And there was a connection to the environment. And it was a keyboard. Um, how sad is that? So first, I want to talk a bit about European form of uh, intuition and how it is trained, because I think it is good, um, especially if, uh, like Diana already acknowledged about um, a certain German form. And I would say also I was raised in the Netherlands, a Dutch form of activism as misery. But there's also a certain form of um, intuition present in that. And that is the intuition that gets trained through the romantic, right? And then we can see that, for instance, uh, in the ideas of Bildung, like how do we become a proper citizen, right? And it's a very intuitive process. Um, so, like, if we look at Goethe, Wilhelm Meister, uh, one of these ancient, these books from that era, uh, we see that this Wilhelm Meister intuitively cares for what appears to be his own child. And that is, of course, that the mother in that story, the sexist story, conveniently passes away before the caring happens, makes also this child, um, it does not matter whether it is his own child, or if it's just a child that Wilhelm Meister cares for, because what matters is that he trains this child to become part of his own class, right? So this intuitive connection to his own class that is proposed by uh, Goethe is an intuitive connection to uh, the institution and the institution as the form in which uh, European power is kept, right? And so, being aware of this form of intuitive work that takes place on the everyday basis um, in, in Europe, um, we still can see that if our intuition says something is wrong, something is wrong, but sometimes it is our intuition that is wrong. Um, and so now from here on, I'm going to think about that intuition as a connection to the environment. So when we're going to leave the intuitive connection to the institution behind, uh, maybe because we never had it, or maybe because we don't aspire to it, uh, maybe because we think inclusion and rights will not liberate us from management, but at best protect us from it, uh, we're going to make other connections to the environment, as David already gave. So intuition rests there on the sensuous. Right, it is the sensuous connection, the, the many different openings we have in our being to be in the environment uh, that we are. And this uh, sensuous, maybe the aesthetic, and Diana already brought the uh, abundance in, we can understand that partly as a trans femme aesthetic, an aesthetic that is not uh, aspiring to power, but is aspiring to a certain. Uh, openness, a certain abundance, and a certain luxuriating in the world that we are in without having the means of production. So it is not a luxuriating that comes out of capitalism. It is a luxuriating in the sensuous and intuitive possibilities of connection to the environment and opening them up rather than purifying them to the one single thing that is the right thing, right? So it is not knowing what is the right thing. It is intuiting what is possible that we find in the trans aesthetic. So if we step back to the sensuous and we go to Marxism, we find actually that the PhD of Karl Marx was about uh, the sensuous connection to the world, right? Karl Marx was a classically trained philosopher who wrote um, about Epicurus and who helps us to see how we sense change rather than plan or plot change, right? It is an an opening to an ever shifting environment whereby our sensorium needs to become activated, active and remain active in order not to be alienated from that environment. So the moment we shrink ourselves into the institution our perception shrinks as well, we cannot see what is out of the institution, right? And so there's a certain form of, um, as Philomena Asset calls it, a certain form of smug ignorance where you have the social power to deny the ignorance that keeps you entrapped in institutions. 
Um, and yet, if we drop out of that, the, the realm opens. So um, in this sensuous connection, there is the possibility of alternatives to the um, institution. And agreeing with David and coming to Anshul Dua here, uh, I think Anshul Dua is um, in that book, Light in the Dark, uh, Luz and Oscuro, she gives a, a beautiful example of where knowledge can go wrong. So she comes to a feminist conference. So in that feminist conference is a fight. Um, and she, together with a few other people, steps in the middle of that fight and tries to repair connections, right, by being in between, occupying the space in between and see the possibility, bless you, of bridging and um, uh, making new connections. And she does that with a deep and long knowledge of politics, of experience, of um, having been in these spaces for decades. And at some point in this few days, she notices with whatever knowledge I brought in, trying to repair, I have become the problem. And I think that is the moment where a deep uh, spiritual work starts to happen, that you can step in and without uh, sliding into guilt, you can still draw in and say, I have become the problem despite my good politics, despite my good knowledge, despite my experience. And that is a moment that something starts to happen, right? So, but Maria Lugones helps us to see in that moment, a colleague, a friend of uh, Anshadua, we can say, uh, who recently passed away, um, Maria Lugones helps us see that sometimes we bring our knowledge and our experience into an environment, but what we need to do is lose what we know in order to um, open ourselves up to the environment so that the complicity in the problem that we can easily become, whatever good knowledge we bring, whatever experience we bring, however well we have been trained as organizers, so that we can still become the complicit in the problem, that we open up to the complexity. So that this moment that we drop and lose and sit in our spiritual connection, um, we can ask the question, how do I make sense of this world? Um, and how do I sense the world? And at the same time also ask, how am I being sensed? To show that there's no guilt, the transgression of the law that's at stake, but the moment of having different worlds collide and the necessary friction in that uh, collision can only be held in that intuitive space. So if we then think about magic, Magic is making a connection to the unknown, to reach out to something that you do not always know what it is, because you can maybe sense it, but you do not know it. And at that moment, I think, as communists, we have a choice. Do we make that connection institutional and just impose a reason upon the world, or do we make that choice spiritual or intuitive and just hold the space for the complexity and let the world come on to us. And I think at this moment, I want to return uh, the talk to Oleg Sieradinsky, who will show us how in the quote unquote real existing socialism, there were experiments with this. Thank you, Mike, and thank you all uh, for your contributions. I just want to double check, can you hear me well? Yeah, and uh, double check. Uh, I really uh, want to just the host. Uh, is it allowed to share the screen in this session? Because I would like also to show you a short video fragment as part of my presentation that hopefully will make it more fun. And so um, uh, when we were preparing with the, our collective to this contribution, one of the questions that we actually asked ourselves ourselves uh, we formulated as follows is there a space in communism for esoteric weirdos and i think this is a question that's to be taken really seriously and maybe one of the one of um, the ways to find answer to the question is to look back into history of the so-called uh, real existing communism yeah more specifically the uh, soviet system uh, and uh, to try to allocate uh, the space that esoterics 
and parascience uh, occupied within that system. That was, as we uh, might know, allegedly extremely kind of positivist society, a society allegedly based on extreme forms of positivist science. Yeah, it was based on strict dogmas of uh, what was uh, kind of called in the Soviet Union, the scientific communism. Yes, and uh, basically this was a society allegedly based on the harsh oppression of every form of religion or any form of belief that was not Soviet socialism, that was not scientific communism. Uh, but uh, actually, um, as part of my uh, film research, uh, when I was st when I started to look at the science films, the, the the, the, the genre of the science film as it evolved in the USSR as opposed to the genre of science film in the West, in the US mostly, I very soon realized that this picture is absolutely, does not correspond with reality in a way. So when I started to look at the tradition of Soviet science films, very quickly I realized that this kind of conventional educational form of cinema was in the Soviet Union was actually full of things like parapsychology, esoterics, and various other forms of knowledge that we may now call the parascience. Yeah, and just to give you one illustration of how deep, uh, how deep this intrusion of the so-called parascience into the allegedly positivist Soviet society was, I'll show you a short fragment of the film called uh, Seven Steps Beyond the Horizon by the Kiev-based filmmaker uh, Felix Sobolev, made in 1968. Uh, I hope you can now see the film, and I'm playing it. Just two minutes. We cannot hear the audio if there is some. Shall we pause? Right. If you can't hear the sound, right? Yeah, we can't. Yeah, it's okay because like the sound has no okay. kind of, yeah, I, I'll try to fix this, but um, perfect. Yeah. I think it's because you guys are on uh, headphones, so that only you can hear the sound, but we can't hear you. It's, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, so um, I should stress that this was the fragment, uh, not of a mystery film, yeah, uh, it was a fragment of a quite mainstream documentary film that basically documents the, one of the experiments of Soviet parapsychological science, namely the experience of blind driving, yeah, so the person uh, who was driving blindfolded was supposed to read the thoughts of a lady 
who was uh, who had her hand uh, on his shoulder yeah and by in that way transferring uh, her knowledge of basically where to turn the wheel yeah and for the purpose of this ex experiment the entire city center of kiev was shut down as you could see and it, they were escorted by the military and so on and so forth um yeah and so um this film seven steps beyond the horizon as well as numerous other films by felix sobolev and other mainstream filmmakers documentary filmmakers in the soviet union really kind of are, kind of are devoted to sort of uh there there are forms of popular science products aimed at promoting basically uh, this kind of knowledge which kind of made me think of the kind of uh discursive structure of the soviet of communist society of pseudo communist society in the soviet union uh where of course in fiction film for instance you had absolutely no place for mystery film no place for horror film this film genre simply did not exist in the soviet union it was impossible to produce a film like that um yeah while which is completely the opposite situation to popular culture of the time in the west yeah where you get where you had like major um uh, kind of the developments in uh, in mystery film and in, in in horror film genre so the parapsychological issues were kind of pushed out into these forms of mass culture right whereas in popular science films that uh, were produced in the US or in the west uh, at the time as far as, as i could see there was actually no place for forms of knowledge like that yeah there was no place for uh parapsychology or esoterics yeah and so uh it kind of uh, by way of this research it occurred to me that actually this was not a deviation uh in uh, uh one form of mass production that was soviet filmmaking uh that actually the soviet society uh in the post war period despite its credentials as science based society was really over kind of taken over by esoteric forms of knowledge and uh i uh, was um um uh, lucky to uh, access uh, the newly published uh, work by the the russian scholar nikolai mitrokhin who uh, outlines this takeover in great detail so for those in case anyone is able to read russian i'd be happy to share this it's only in russian so far yeah and so uh I'll just try to very briefly outline what happened here yeah? uh, according to Mitrokhin and based on my uh, kind of research into science film so uh, what basically happened to the Soviet communist society why uh, why uh, was the official uh, positive science supplemented and taken over by esoterics so one reason for that is after the initial really anti-religious fiercely anti-religious period of soviet communism in the interwar period starting from the second world war there is a revival and the reintroduction of orthodox christianity yeah as a form as a form of basically semi official uh, form of domination uh, of the popular masses yes yeah, so uh, stalin actually reintroduced orthodox christianity as a form of um, uh institutional institutionalized knowledge uh, then uh a really important aspect of this is uh because of the structure of of knowledge of uh that soviet society was reproducing the humanities in the soviet union were completely and utterly dominated by natural sciences yeah so there was even like a uh like anecdote that dismissed the humanities by saying that there are only two kinds of sciences natural sciences and non-natural sciences or unnatural sciences that is like philosophy history and things like that uh yeah and um uh the third aspect of this of this uh takeover was the utter destruction of the institute of uh, academic critique in the soviet union 
by uh, basically political domination and by the domination of the party dogmas, yeah, and by um, uh, censorship, yeah. So I will I will not really go into uh, detail of this esoteric takeover of. Uh, uh, the, the first and so far uh, the last allegedly communist society on earth. I will just give you one detail that uh, kind of gives a hint at the scale of this takeover. So in late 1970s and early 1980s, the, the kind of elderly Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev, who was uh, kind of really uh, kind of elderly and sick person at the time, who was actually kind of narcoleptic, um, and who could barely function as a head of state, even as a human being, he, he could barely function. So, so towards the end of his life, uh, uh, it became known that he kind of reached out to, to uh, a certain uh, so-called popular healer known as Juna, uh, who was actually invited to heal this elderly communist leader, Leonid Brezhnev, by way of manipulating his energetic fields, so this was basically one of his last, uh, one of his last, um, uh, yeah, um, attempts to to cling to uh, to to his position as the head of state. Yeah, uh, the popular healer Juno was manipulating the energetic fields of Leonid Brezhnev, which of course had a major impact not just. From the bottom up, yeah. So the esoteric esoteric beliefs started to spread not just from the bottom up, but from the top down, yeah. Because from the moment Leonid Brezhnev reached out to an esoteric healer, this became already a part of institutionalized, yeah, almost conventional sort of uh, knowledge knowledge based practice. And of course, as we know from history, uh, very soon um, this collusion kind of between esoterics and Soviet communism uh, brought about the end of the letter. And I will just end by kind of uh, trying to contemplate why exactly did this happen? Why did uh, esoteric belief became incompatible with Soviet communism? And maybe one of the answers to the question is that uh, Soviet communism itself by that time uh, was in fact nothing more than a dogmatic religion yeah, the way the way it evolved in a autocratic uh, uh, Soviet Union by the end of uh, the uh, late eighties. So maybe it's safe to say that it was not esoterics that brought down Soviet communism, but in a way, vice versa. Esoterics had just exposed the fact that uh, the Soviet system was actually never communist in the true sense of the word. Yeah, I think uh, I should end here so that we have some time to discuss more. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I wonder if the if any of the researchers have questions. So, okay, I think there there is one already by uh, Jessica. Um, so a minute ago, you described Soviet communism as not real communism. And I'm wondering if there are any examples on like a nation state kind of scale of real communism. Yeah, I would say that not just Soviet communism was not real communism. And of course, and I understand that by saying real communism, it's it opens up a whole new terrain of what we mean by real. Yeah, but uh, I think what's really important is the, in your question is the formulation of the nation state. And I think that no, uh, any kind of communism, no kind of communism is, is impossible within the format of the nation state. And this is something that we experienced actually uh, in the Soviet Union, yeah? So uh, the Soviet Union was never meant to be a uh, nation state or even uh, a combination of nation state that emerged yeah, in the interwar period. The October Revolution was basically conceived as nothing else as the beginning of the, of the global revolution. Yeah, and actually by the moment when in the mid 1920s, actually early 1920s, it became clear that it's not coming, yeah, that the Soviet Union is going to be isolated and uh, basically surrounded by hostile powers that 
uh, will not follow suit in, on the evolutionary path. Like this was it, yeah, this was, this was for me, the case was, uh, the case was um, kind of lost um, already in that moment. And this is maybe one of the uh, biggest things to take away from the Soviet experience. But you don't agree, Jessica. Sorry? You didn't agree with that? You look... Uh, well, I'm... Um... I'm wondering, but it's like a personal little, like I'm in Serbia. So Yugoslavia is like very present in my mind. And I'm wondering what Alexi's take on Tito's form of communism would be, but also I don't want to like take up all the space with my Serbia obsession. Uh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but maybe there's a way actually to follow up on that by supplementing this nation state optics with non-nation state optics or with other forms, other forms of collect of, of being together, yeah. Uh, other forms of um, communalism, maybe, yeah. So we don't have to stay in the nation state debate, maybe. I have to agree and say that I'm sitting in East Berlin, and exactly all of these obsessions with ma the maintenance and running, and I guess what what Michael would uh, call the managerial class of running a state overtake all of the more lofty ideals that communism is about. Okay, thank you. I, uh, I know communism ended up not working out in Yugoslavia. Um, so I was just curious, like, would it have been real, but maybe not because it was within a nation state is what it sounds like. Thank you. Although I would also like to point out that if anyone can point out a functioning democracy, I'd like to know where Sony, thank you. Would you like to say something about that? Because I think this is a really important intervention. Oh, um, my family is from Eastern Nepal. So um, my ancestors, like until maybe 150 years ago, used to have this system called Kipat. So it was like a communal land management system where there used to be a manager who would kind of manage the land, but it was non-hierarchical. So the manager was the same as everyone else. But that system was abolished 150 years ago, and then land owning came about. But I think it was a very functional kind of communism because land was related to, like, I guess, your food and, um, yeah, your survival thing, because, like, it was an agricultural state, I guess, yeah. My, I'm from Slovakia and my grandparents, so also part of the Soviet post-Soviet Union and my grandparents, they used to be peasants or like farmers where uh, similar, like, I don't know if it's similar to what Sonny just shared, but like, yeah, people in that part of the world, they all, they had their lands, but they really worked together. And then when communism came as a, as a ideology and, uh, and totalitarian regime like that land became commun communal but actually if anything it really was that the people be people all, all of them became disowned and that community that was when it was their own as such the community worked and then suddenly like the the, the regimes of called communism caused community to not work um, so yeah maybe I would be interested to hear that your thoughts thoughts on that and also on how it, like especially in those countries like how do you communicate your idea of communism and or communalism now with people who have set, like kind of inherently um and justly um real bitterness about um the ideology mm -hmm. I, I would like to maybe turn the discussion back to the the magic communism because actually in a way that's what we're talking about. And in a way this, I think it would be a wasted opportunity for us to go on about the disparities of communism. And one of the you know, huge benefits for me is that I'm able to learn many things and still relate those to other experiences that many people had in other places. And for example, the, like the, one of the things that is like where we can see everywhere, I would like to refer to like, for example, the liberation struggles led by Amerika Cabral in Cape Verde and Guinea-Bissau that were absolutely tied to education. You know, when Castro asked 
um, when Castro asked Cabral what, what would he would need to support the liberation movement and the guerrilla war, it was like weapons, soldiers, you know, what do you need? And Cabral's answer was, I need teachers, I need doctors, and I need for my own people to become teachers and doctors and filmmakers. And so these are types of like liberation struggles where those guerrillas that were in the, in the jungle teamed up with different uh, animist tribes that also worshiped ancestors and whose ancestors like are believed and still inhabit the space of different trees. Those trees were also enlisted in that struggle. So, and those trees also housed the guerrilla schools. And those are things where there's more liberatory moments where there's something different belief systems cross over in order to create a space where something that couldn't happen before can happen. And then it's also something like looking at a pedagogy that allows for understanding how the soil works, what can be farmed, that also isn't reliant on a European knowledge of soil that also doesn't necessarily apply. And so these are things where it's like, the, and for the people that were part of that conflict, that liberation struggle is not really over due to many generations of coups, different European interventions, assassinations and the like, but the, the liberation the people who were the guerrillas in the like in the early like 60s, early 70s remain basically highly respected figures in villages, in cities, and so on, in spite of a turbulent political situation. But due to that resistance and that education that was gained through this like revolutionary moments, people can actually operate on many different levels. And so, and maybe there, which is something inspiring for me not giving up this belief in the, in the ancestors or this relationship to the ancestors in order to exactly be present now and build structures that are not going to harm the future populations to just sort of treat the land and the resources as respectfully as possible in order to like, I, I would go with maybe what, what um, the type of stewardship as like management of taking over the land in order to manage it, not in the sense that Micah means, but in the sense of understanding how the land can be used in order to create enough resources for the current inhabitants, but leaving the basis for enough to be in the future. And those are things which, like there we have a sort of combination of revolutionary moments, movements, and places where there's a kind of combination of science and ancestral beliefs or more magical beliefs that can be very, very uh, like affirmative and create something like, let's say, perhaps less state-based, but another way of being in a revolutionary mode that is going to continue for longer without being then dragged down into managing a state. I would also maybe like to very briefly address the question of Teresa, because I think it's really important still to talk uh, about the things, to ground the things in the so-called post-communist uh, situation, which is basically one of the most difficult places to talk about all things communist. But very briefly, I think that uh, in places like Ukraine for sure, maybe also Slovakia, places that experienced some, some form of uh, flawed communism, yeah? I think we can just try to imagine uh, kind of communism already as part of our ancestral knowledge, yeah? So uh, this is already the part, and this, this is probably what is, what is more difficult to do in other parts of the world. But I, I mean, our, the generations of our grandparents, grand-grandparents and parents, uh, lived through, suffered, but also in some ways flourished uh, under this regime. Uh, I think we, rather than judge it, which is a job that's being done anyway, I think this is basically our ancestral knowledge now. And uh, from there we can, uh, we can imagine it anew. I think I want to say something about agriculture and then I'm going to give it to David to ask if David wants to say something about agriculture. So I grew up on a small farm, so agriculture is always very close to my heart to talk about. Um, and what we see is um, about, I think the time, what you also today so we're talking about, is that industrial agriculture was developed in the 20s uh, in collaboration um, between the USA and uh, and uh, Russia, USSR, right? They were working together in setting up massive 
uh, systems for agriculture. Um, so that you see that it's already a part of industrial alienation that is incorporated. And what, what has happened in the early USSR is that when Lenin and the Bolsheviks took over, uh, he first uh, sort of magnificently gave the land back to the peasants. Um, but then the food stopped arriving in the cities. So there was uh, hunger started to arrive in the cities rather than food. So then when it became the Soviet, uh, the Communist Party, um, he started to uh, implement this industrial agriculture and taking away the land from the peasants again. So then you had peasants that were like pro-Bolsheviks, but anti-communist at the same time, of course, because all the political entanglements never reached uh, the peasant population. And so I think what Alexi says here also about um, looking to the past to build the future is I think what we see here is this, this large scale projects that are necessary to retain other large scale projects, namely you need kind of industrial ag agriculture to retain um, a non-agricultural urban population. So I think if we want to rethink how that goes, and I think these experiments are going at the moment, for instance, in Detroit, where there's a lot of city farming going on, um, we need to have different ways of producing our food because otherwise the exploitation of those that work the land will always take place. And I think this is a very nice moment maybe to shift to, uh, to Mexico where these discussions happen also in an uh, interesting scale, right? Also in that way how certain forms of land ownership leads to uh, social oppression. I, I maybe... Uh... Things <laughs> just uh, maybe to to bring certain thing is that uh, the predominant reading of uh, of the historical transformations of the world are kind of falling into a historical determinism, meaning by this that uh, there is an epoch that replaced the previous an emerging epoch that replaced the previous epoch, an emerging technology that replaced the ancient technology and so on, an emerging re regime that replaces all forms and so on. And uh, this is the biggest myth of uh, modernity because at the end, all modern forms rely on ancient forms of domination as we see, like the coloniality of power. Uh, it's a, there is certain discontinuity, but uh, there is a certain coercivity in these processes. So it's, uh, it's been described as a process of uneven and combined uh, development by many theories, like to look at it as a process of uneven and combined development. So saying that, it also allows for a nonlinear reading of this, I think. For instance, to connect, uh, like what was happening with the Jesuit, this is an old story, no? The Jesuits uh, missionaries in, in the uh, new world and then sending the reports to the church, uh, to, to the Christian church and then this passing through uh, people such as uh, Thomas Moreau and then writing his fiction uh, or their fiction about utopia societies and how this kind of detonates certain imaginations that feedbacks into a lot of a uh, kind of evolution of, of this lit literary evolution of what utopia means. But uh, maybe to connect it to the, to the kind of constituency of a uh, liberation struggle uh, I think one of the biggest betray betrayal of the revolutionary process was the promise of uh, uh, land, uh, like the, the agronom, the, what was translated into the agrarian reform. So the promise of uh, redistributing the lands, uh, and then without accounting that there was that there has always been modes of politics. So so it was a dissociative politics because what did denied was the forms of politics that existed there despite the configuration of the nation state. I mean, because at the end, the, the, the revolutionary process was co-opted by a liberal ideology for the construction of the nation state. And the displacement was, as we know, just transferring the power of management from the church into a secular form and, and so on. And, and we know this cycle, like kind of how it is repeating. So perhaps the here the intuition will be to kind of find ways to regrasp uh, forms of politics that does that not does not become constitutive but relational and, and uh, kind of multi dialectical so that it also opens to the complexity and so on 
And maybe one kind of uh, example on, on, on this, how the potential of this is to say, to look, for instance, what happened with the Haitian Revolution, which uh, when, when the Haitian Revolution was declared, uh, the negotiation with the, it was like the, the Napoleonic forces that could not contain, and then they say like, well, we will give you your, we will give you your liberty. And they say like, no, we're not fighting for our liberty. We are fighting for the liberty of everyone. So for that, there was a kind of radical openness in that sense that uh, kind of the force, the there was not a dissociation between the peop oppressed people of, uh, of the Napoleonic empire in other parts of the continent and uh, their, the oppression in the specific, uh, uh, in the specific territory of Haiti. So this kind of uh, this kind of drive of opening like that uh, collectivity as a non-definite uh, condition, and then for a complex condition that requires restoring relations constantly, reevaluating politics constantly, reformulating, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, what can be imagined and so on. It's actually interesting to, to respond to that, David. What we see there is that we first have two bourgeois revolutions, right, of um, national liberation. First, the glorious revolution in the, in, in the UK, it's the first bourgeois revolution. Then the French Revolution is the second bourgeois revolution, right? And the first working class revolution that we get in the quote unquote modern world and the, the post colonial, the, the the, the colonial world is actually the Haitian revolution. And the Haitian revolution is then the first revolution that does not fight for national liberation. But as David says, it fights for the liberation of all, right? And goes on to continue in the dreams and desires of the American South, of the young Bolsheviks, Guinea-Bissau <laughs> travels and travels and travels. So those that energy still is out there. Great. So I think we, you know, like I wanted to ask a couple of things, but I think time is sober. But what would be the the best way to get in touch with you in case any of the researchers would like to uh, ask you further questions? I think mine and David's email addresses are known at the University of the <laughs> Underground. Uh, yeah, well, you can type your email if you want, because we, we cannot share them directly. Okay. So if you type them, that would be awesome. Oh, no. mm. Okay. I, I have a question, and that is because this session yes. was recorded. Could you give us a, a copy of the recording? Yeah. And I would like to ask what are your plans to do with the recording? Well, <laughs> thank you. Well, it goes to our, uh, to the YouTube account of the university. Uh, but yes, I, I, we can send you a copy of the, of the lecture. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I think we've got all your emails here. Okay, well, thank you so much once again for, for this lecture. Uh, we needed more time, but hopefully, yeah, in the future, our orbits will align again. So thanks. Hope to see you very soon.